This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, recorded live on blogtalkradio.com on June 9th, <laughs> 2008. In his new book, I Have Fun Everywhere I Go, Mike Edison does for sex, drugs, and rock and roll what Hulk Hogan did for wrestling. No, scratch that. Edison hates Hogan. Saying that will just piss him off. How about Mike Edison does for sex, drugs, and rock and roll what Lennon and McCartney did for elevator music? Nah, damn, that won't work either. Edison hates the Beatles. All right, here's a thought. Let me just read the subtitle of Edison's book. It's so long, people will think it's an introduction and not notice that I left out all the stuff about him being a former editor of High Times, Cherry, and Main Event, a contributor to Screw and Hustler magazines, and drummer in bands such as Launch Hands, Pleasure Fuckers, and Rocket Train. All right, so let's start here. Please welcome my guest today, Mike Edison, author of I Have Fun Everywhere I Go, Savage Tales of Pot, Porn, Punk Rock, Pro Wrestling, Talking Apes, Evil Bosses, Dirty Blues, American Heroes, and the most notorious magazines in the world. Mike, welcome to Mr. Media. Hey, thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. Boy, you got my number all right. I heard that, <laughs> I heard that Hulk Hogan intro, and, I, and steam was coming out of my ears. I hadn't even gotten started, and I was uh, gearing up to give you a suplex or a pile driver. <laughs> See that? Got to got to wonder about these things. Well, I appreciate you being here, and I got to you know. And I guess it's obvious from the introduction. There are so many things that one learns about you from reading your new book. <laughs> but wh- what do you have against poor Hulk Hogan and the Beatles? Well, where should we start? You know, like Abby Hoffman says, "Sacred cows make the best hamburgers." Hogan can't wrestle. Let's start right there. <laughs> <laughs> he his way out of a paper bag, and that was the biggest con. And in a in a game that is based on gimmicks and tomfoolery and, and the con artistry, he he is the the worst of the lot. Um, wrapping himself in red, white, and blue, and his talks about not to do drugs and staying in school. You know, Bob, he's just not my kind of people. <laughs> Are you enjoying all the trouble that he's in now? Well, you know, I'm sure he's a nice guy. I don't, you know, I hate the fact that his son was responsible for wrapping his car around a pole and hitting his kid, but have you watched his TV show? What a train wreck. These people have such bad taste. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't wish the guy any more harm, you know, outside of the ring. Inside the ring, he's roadkill. But um, his poor <laughs> brainless wife, his poor brainless children, I feel bad for them. The fact that he can breed and that they might be able to vote and be somehow responsible for choosing the next president, that scares me. <laughs> now, really, I, I really didn't want you to hold back here. I really didn't you know, come out swinging and tell me what you really thought. You know, Bob, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> and let's let's go to your other favorite. Uh, what's their name again? Oh, yeah, the Beatles. Oh, You've got that, a problem with the Beatles, too, oh, right? Good Lord, enough. Haven't we heard enough of them already? Hey, Jude, does anybody honestly think that's good music? You know, it sounds like the retarded kid down the street practicing his piano lesson. You know, it's like, for, I don't actually hate everything they do, but every time I mention my antipathy towards these guys, it's people see red. You know, it's, it's really a hot button issue with people. Patty Smith, too. Somehow you're not allowed to say bad things about Patty. Um, but with the Beatles, my God, you know, you, you think they were the only rock and roll band in the world. I mean, look, for every year of blues that they did, for every tax man, for every helter skelter, there was a Rocky Raccoon or an Obladi Oblada. That's what I'm saying. When I'm 64, it's, it's just really unfortunate. I mean, to me, Sgt. Pepper was the death knell of rock and roll. It legitimized so much bad music. Concept records and, 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 and pothead art records. It's really not rock and roll. It's not even rock. Oh, my God. How did you ever get laid hate, hating the Beatles? <laughs> you know, you'd be surprised at how many like-minded people there are out there. Like, <laughs> like-minded women once you can cut through the clutter. Really? All right, I'll take your word for it. Well, now, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that you know, people listening will get this, but you have expertise across so many fields. Of course, there's the great line, uh, well, I want to quote it correctly here. It's uh, uh, near the back of the book, uh, having to do with your resume. Uh, you list, uh, number one, sex magazines. Number two, beer magazine. Number three, pot magazine. That's not a resume. That's a crime scene. I just want to establish that for everybody, that we're talking to a guy here with uh, – Mutual, uh, mutual problems. Mutual uh, uh, qualifications, I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, when I, when I send my resume, I have to wrap it in yellow tape. 
<laughs> I'll send it in one of those uh, brown paper uh, uh, wrappers that the the adult magazines used to go into. Yeah, you know, um, uh, you know that that sword cuts both both ways. Um, you know, I do have my specialties. You know, in the, in the vice department. Um, <laughs> he said, "I probably I'll never probably never get a gig at Condé Nast." But then again, who would really want to? Well, you know. Like uh, like like Thoreau once said, beware all enterprises that require new clothes. <laughs> yeah, but you also know. Okay, but you also make the point late in your book when you when you're leaving uh, high times that it, it, it's helpful to have a suit. You, you, it is helpful to have a suit. I didn't say anything about a new suit. Damn, I've been trucking the same one around for years. Um, a good tie uh, helps too. Well, you know, you work for High Times and you show up at a meeting and they expect you to be wearing a uh, Willie Nelson t-shirt with your hair down to your ass and, you know, and your toes sticking out of your shoes and you show up wearing a suit and a tie and, uh, and you've got the upper hand. You know, business is business and, uh, <laughs> you know, and you gotta sell, sell, sell. Those are the three things I learned in the professional wrestling business. Sell, sell, and sell. And it doesn't change in the marijuana magazine business. You know, people think, think, people show up wearing their, uh, you know, ready to go to the Pink Floyd concert outfits with the bong, and when you got your shit together and you're sober and you're uh, sitting across the table and you know what's going on, you always have an advantage. Mm. Oh, uh, Mike, that reminds me. You asked me in an email, can you cuss? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I, of I, course. I, I think the horse has left the barn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what, Mike? I, I've got to pause with you for a moment. I've just, got, I've just gotten Skype by a, a woman uh, who says I'm... I'm Loveth Sasani from West Africa, Ghana, female 24. Permit me to chat with you, and I'm afraid between the two of you, I think I'm going to have to go with her. <laughs> oh, got to love Skype. Um, so, you know, the thing about you is that so much stuff happens in your book. I mean, granted, it takes place over, you know, several years, but, I mean, do you ever feel like you've lived more than one life? No, I think the dots connect pretty logically. Uh, honestly, um, I think maybe um, it puts into sharp relief uh, the comatose state that many people are in. I don't think I live with <laughs> one life. I just think other people aren't living theirs, maybe. All right. You know, nothing in my book was premeditated. When I fell into the porn business, it was because I was an out-of-work writer. And when the, the one porn magazine led to another, it was more of the same. And um, but I always played the drums and I always played the guitar. And when someone called up and said, hey, let's go to Amsterdam and uh, do this tour, it didn't take take really more than a few moments to say, all right, I'm going to drop out of school. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow that. You know, while, while, while I can, and everything just seemed to flow very logically. I had no, I mean, if you told me when I was a teenager, I'd be, uh, you know, feuding with Hulk Hogan and in the wrestling ring and, you know, working for high times and smoking the centerfold weed and hanging out at porn stars and running around New Orleans with strippers. I, I would have laughed, but while I was in the moment, it all made perfect sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> any, any, uh, regrets? Uh, I mean, you know, you're a grown man. I'm, I'm guessing you're maybe early, mid 50s? Oh my God. This interview is over. No, Bob. I'm uh, 43 years old, just old enough. No. I'm 43, 1964, August 2nd. Everybody can now send me uh, uh, birthday Oh, my present. God. Um, just old enough to see the first man land on the moon, which was uh, when my father woke me up to, to watch that. It was probably the last nice thing he did for me. Um, and uh, 53, my God. The problem is, is that everyone else at high times is uh, coming around the corner at 60 and is long past 50. Um, you know, believe it or not, I was, I was like the, one of the younger guys on the senior staff there. And I was in my late 30s. Wow. I, I just, uh, I'm, 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 sub- I'm stunned because uh, I just, I, I guess from reading and all the things that, that happen, and the, uh, I just, just thought you were older. I really did. So lucky you. Well, it ain't the years; it's the miles. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the thing wow. is, when I, when, I was, when I was young and I had no sense of my mortality, um, I never thought I'd see thirty. But seeing as I hit thirty doing one hundred and ten, now I'm pretty pretty much prepared to live forever. Have you? Uh, I, I mean, you talk a lot in the book about your vices, and I mean, uh, whether it's uh, well, pro, you know, uh, drugs, there's alcohol, there's rock, there's uh, rock and roll. Uh, have you slowed down at all? Uh, on all and any of that stuff is any of it. I mean, it, at times you even talk about how uh, you know uh, one uh, one girlfriend, uh, you know, long term relationship got very caught up in uh, smoking pot, and you saw you seem to see some damage to the relationship caused by that. And I just kind of wondered, after all those years, 
Have you slowed down? Have you, you know, rethought any of that? Well, I mean, I still have my moments. Um, I had to sit down and write a book, and, you know, I write really best when I'm clear-headed. So that sort of steered me away from sport drinking at the bar every night. But there are huge downsides to the pot smoking. I think I, think I knew that when I first got into it. I, you know, I learned pretty quick that not a whole lot was getting done if I was stoned during the day. Mm. Um, I love to smoke pot. You know what it is? When, and people said, oh, you're going to work at high times. You're going to be stoned all the time. Actually, it turned, turned me into a bit of a drunk just, just to deal with the stress of dealing with these you know, allegedly mellow stoners. I hardly ever smoked pot when I was working at high times. Um, it was a fool's paradise. You know, mm-hmm. you can't get stoned during the day. You, nothing gets done. If you smoke pot at 420, you can bet your ass that at 430 the lawyer's going to call or an angry advertiser's going to call. And you're going to be stoned, and then what are you going to do? Hey, let's uh, let's let's pause it for a minute. Let's talk about 420. I, you know, I'm uh, 25 years out of college, and I think this is something I may have forgotten that I knew. But 420 has a great significance, and maybe you could fill in uh, those folks who don't get it what that means. I'm not, I'm not even going to comment on the irony of forgetting what 420 means. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> but 420 is the shibboleth. Uh, for smoking weed, or, or, or for the weed itself. It, it, it's, it's code for let's get stoned. And the common myth would be that 420 is California police code uh, for someone getting stoned in progress, which um, has never been proven. I think that's just part of the mythology. Um, it's weird. The true story, the most likely true story, is that there were some Grateful Deadheads out in uh, California, in Southern California, and they had a uh, policy of meeting every day at 420. And that was their little code. Let's 420. So they made it 420, and they started putting this on flyers, uh, which they hand out at Grateful Dead concerts, and they went to see the New Riders of the Purple Sage, and it sort of caught on through the hippie community like that. But there's some there's some weird oddball coincidence about 420. 420 is um, like a magic number. You used to be looking at any old textbooks about marijuana and cannabis. It'll tell you um, that there are 420 separate chemicals in marijuana. I believe that is or not as you like, but it's a number that kept popping up. Uh, I think everybody by now knows that, that rainy day woman number twelve and thirty five. Everybody uh-huh. must get stoned about Bob song. Twelve times thirty five is four twenty. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, wow. but then, like I always remind people of that Crosby, Stills and Nash song, who I like about as much as the Beatles. Um, there's four that song four plus twenty, which is a real bummer. So so go figure. Nonetheless. Next time you see someone wearing a 420 cap or a 420 sticker on the bottom of their skateboard or on their guitar case, uh, you know they're stoner friendly. Got it. Okay, I'll uh, I will keep that in mind. I guess I will understand that better in the future. I, you know, it's funny. I, I uh, uh, I'll admit this, so there's no confusion. I, I I'm not a I'm not a guy who's done uh, drugs. I don't drink. Uh, Never. But I have. I have. I have to point out before I'm, I'm before you hang up on me here. I did write for Gallery Magazine a few times. Hey, it's fine by location. I've been in there myself. <laughs> uh, so you know, I, I don't want I don't want you to hang up and think, oh, this guy is screwed. Um, which part? I mean, there's there's this. You can almost uh, compartmentalize all the different things that you've been involved with. It was the wrestling. You were writing porno books. You've written for porn magazines. Uh, uh, the, the high times per- period that seemed to have lasted a long time relative to some of the other things. And uh, through all this, of course, you've played in a variety of bands. Which I mean, which of these compartments have you enjoyed the most as you look back, and, and you know, as you wrote the book, and which you know, do you really wish that you had kind of skipped that that portion of your life? Oh man, I wish I had never taken the job as publisher of High Times. Boy, I usually don't say I don't regret a thing. It's not I never regret what I do. It's but I, I regret what I haven't done. Mm. You know, maybe there was an opportunity I somehow passed, but I was warned too about uh, what was going to happen to me at high times, and they 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 really uh, hung me up on my ankles and flogged me mercilessly once I got there. As you can imagine, it's not a place too big on respecting authority, and, <laughs> and um, you know, and you know, when I say authority, I just I just mean like you know the the uh, most easygoing sort of hierarchy where at the end of the day, someone's got to be the last guy in line signing on things, taking responsibility to get the magazine out the door. You know that, but it just really, really doesn't work there. They're very suspect of uh, anybody who's got a big, who's got a big office. Um, one of the editors saw me using a calculator once, and that kind of freaked him out because the fact that I knew how to like add a couple numbers together meant I was, you know, a, you know, a bean counter. I was a suit all of a sudden. Mm. Um, you know, the whole thing to me comes, you know, comes together. I only ever wanted to be a writer and a musician, and that's what happened. So I'm living, I'm living my dream. 
I'm very happy with the way things worked out, and I'm still playing music, and I'm writing all the time, so I'm, I'm a happy guy. Now, uh, we, we exchanged some email earlier, and I was surprised to hear that you were actually calling from an office. What are you doing that you need an office for? These days? <laughs> um, well, uh, very, very, very uh, legit, or as legit as Mike Edison gets. I'm editing books. I work for an unbelievably cool book publisher called Backbeat Books. And in fact, right now, I'm editing a book called I Hate New Music, The Classic Rock Manifesto. Uh, by a guy named Dave Thompson, who trumps all of us. Dave's written over a hundred books. Oh my! <laughs> right? He's written the Judas Priest bio and the Deep Purple bio and the David Bowie bio. I mean, he's he's a machine. I wrote almost thirty pornographic novels, but but Dave's output dwarfs he, he, even my my most pernicious filth. Um, wow. And that's what I do during the day. We did a book called the Official Punk Rock Book of Lists. It's kind of a dream job, actually. Uh, like I said, it's like rock and roll and writing. It's all I ever wanted to do, and uh, yeah. and it's good. It's a good way to spend my days. It keeps me out of the opium den. <laughs> uh, somehow, I I don't think that's as much of an issue as maybe it was. Well, <laughs> like I said, I have my moments. Yeah. <laughs> Let me. Uh, I want to give out our phone number if uh, if anyone's listening uh, to us live today, uh, June ninth. Uh, uh, give us a call if you'd like to talk to Mike about. Uh, <sighs> Well, pretty much, pretty, there's pretty much nothing you can't ask this guy. I suspect it's all it's, uh, all, it's all out there. I've got I've got nothing to hide. And honestly, I, why, why would I? I'm always shocked when people they read the book and they say, "Well, I can't believe you know you, you talk about you know you know you, the, the, the barrel of gin that you drank or the amount of the cocaine you snorted or the you know the sheets of acid you dropped or, or, or whatever." It's like to me, it's just pretty normal. Isn't that part of the job description of being a 24 year old punk rocker? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> well, uh, the number to call is 646-595-3135. And uh, I, I've noticed over time that uh, usually the more interesting the guest is, the fewer the calls. So that'll be interesting. I, <laughs> I have a feeling you can carry this hour. Yeah, I could probably sit back and just let you talk. Uh, no, please don't do that. No one do that. <laughs> I assure you. In, in fact, the public will rally around with uh, tire irons and torches, I'm sure, and insist that you put a volume control in my head. I encourage no. people to call. <laughs> What did your voice sound like when you were 23? Uh, I'm thinking it was not quite this. Um, yeah, pretty rough, pretty pretty rough today, right? Uh, yeah, well, I've been singing and reading a lot. Um, okay. We just got we just came back from the world's loudest book tour. Ah. And uh, we're on the West Coast, and uh, we had L.A. and Seattle and San Francisco and Portland, and uh, we we're doing some gigs in New York in, in uh, the upcoming weeks. So when I read, I read with my band. My current band is the. Uh, the rocket train Delta Science Orchestra, and we made it. We made this crazy beatnik jazz and punk rock boogaloo soundtrack record to go along with the book, and it's me telling stories. It's very filthy, mm-hmm. and hopefully very funny. And it's a collaboration with my friend uh, John Spencer of Blues Explosion and Heavy Trash and Pussy Galore fame, uh, mm-hmm. and it's very psychedelic and noisy. And uh, we've been rehearsing it, and that that requires like a lot of hollering and whiskey drinking and like that. So. That's what brings me to you today in such a fine fellow. Well, let me, uh, I want to give you a second. I, I want to play uh, <clears throat> something from, uh, now, well, now tell me, I, I have uh, the CD in front of me. Uh, I have fun everywhere I go. Now, is this actually available to the public? Yeah, you bet it is. Uh, right now it's on iTunes, and this is the record yeah. I was just talking about. Um, we're real, real proud of this. Um, cause I think it's a revolutionary turn on the spoken word thing. Um, it was definitely... Uh, influenced by listening to like Jack Kerouac, playing, Jack Kerouac playing with bongo players and some jazz musicians, but we really, really ramped it up um, to 21st century uh, schizophrenia. Um, it's called I Have Fun Everywhere I Go, same as the book, Savage Tales of Pot, Porn, Punk Rock, Pro Wrestling, and a whole bunch of other shit. And it's available on iTunes right now, and soon will be available on Amazon and in independent record stores everywhere. And is it oh, if you, if someone is listening and they go to iTunes, is it under Mike Edison or is it under Edison? It's under uh, Mike Ed, uh, Mike Edison is where to find it. <laughs> okay. Well, this is uh, I'm going to play a couple of uh, things from it. Uh, this is a, a short one right now. This is called Space Bop. Do you want to you want to introduce this? Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, this is good because this is the wholesome side of my book. This is this is uh, about my um, aborted career as astronaut. Um, it's not all about sex and drugs. It can't be, right? I now, did. we'll get to that. <clears throat> I did aspire to be an astronaut. I really did. I was saying before, I saw the first man land on the moon, and that really um, that opens up a young boy's eyes, right? 
Right. Um, and that's what this story is about. There was NASA actually had a journalist in space program. Uh, there was going to be their plan to send the next civilian in space after they sent the teacher up, um, and that didn't work out so well. So they um, 86 the journalist in space program, and even though I was sure I was going to get in, being a pornographer and a wrestling writer such as I was, um, no shot at it because the teacher blew up and that's the end of the tale. So I'm, giving, I'm already giving away too much. This is space box. <laughs> Here we go. Immediately, Mike is going to jump in here and tell you what I'm going to tell you, and that was that was not called Space Bop. That was actually called G.G. Allen. Uh, G.G. Allen died last night, I believe. Uh, I just mislabeled it, apparently, when I uploaded it. I apologize for that. That's all right. Outer space, punk rock, it's all the same. <laughs> well, so uh, obviously, uh, we should probably explain the G.G. Allen connection. You guys were, uh, I guess, in, in the same regard that anyone could have been friends with uh, G.G. Allen. You were uh friends with G.G. Allen. Yeah, um, we, we were friends. I counted him as a friend um, and vice versa. I don't know how many people he really knew that um, he had uh, normal friendship sort of relationship with, but um, it was a degree of mutual respect between us. Uh, I mean, he'd stay at my house all the time. There's never any problems. And I know people have this idea of G.G., uh, which is largely correct, by the way, that um, he was out of control and um, dangerous. And uh, like I said, uh, the only the only man uh, where the, uh, the the man outshined the myth like Liberty Valance in reverse um, because he was capable of doing anything. I mean, there was a guy who was not afraid to die and felt no pain. Just ab- absolutely um, a wild animal. But uh, beneath all of that, he pretty, could be pretty pretty damn charming when he felt like it. And he was pretty funny and very smart guy. And we had very similar taste in music. He went for Hank Williams and uh, the New York Dolls and the Rolling Stones and blues and country music over um, 
you know, the prevalent thrash bands of the day. Uh, and we, we, uh, we both like to drink Jim Beam a lot. Mm. So uh, we, we got along all right. We got along just fine. I wrote a very long story about him for Screw Magazine. I think it was probably the only time anyone ever took him seriously as an artist. Um, I think that impressed him. And after that, he had invited me to join his band, which <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was was that the first time you had like uh, bottles of beer and stuff thrown at you on stage? Uh, no, no, it, it, it was not. No, um, actually, not the no, last. No, hopefully not. I kind of missed that actually. <laughs> um, you know, I always say you can never gauge the quality or strength of your performance uh, by how polite the applause is, but on the uh, the power of the response. Hmm. He, um, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with Alan, frankly, uh, until after he died. And, you know, like a lot of people, you know, it, he hadn't really, uh, um, I just hadn't run across him. But I thought what was interesting is that after he died, of course, you get all the stories about all the, you know, the flame out moments and the horrible things. You actually tell a, a very different, uh, side of him at the end that, um, uh, I think that his, uh, uh his girlfriend, um, uh, had, uh, had, had died. And then his mother got run over by his father, and it just he just couldn't take any um, Well, well this is actually um, about my friend David Surgent. Uh, oh, am I got that backwards? I'm sorry. From Reagan Youth. What was this? Um, uh, you know, the thing about Gigi and, um, well, the stories sort of go hand in hand, because here were two guys I knew who died not too terribly far apart. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Two, you know, two musicians, two punk rockers who were very, very different people. Gigi had a death wish. Uh, there's no question about it. And he always said he was going to die on stage in the ultimate rock and roll death, and he was going to take a few people with him. And uh, in the story, uh, like I sing in the song, um, last time I saw him, you know, we were just having a very pleasant afternoon, just sort of like uh, having a rooftop barbecue. And he said to me, you know, you coming to my gig tomorrow? And I was like, you know, absolutely fucking not. You know, we're having a nice time. And tomorrow's going to be, you know, bad vibes from start to finish. Why would I, why, why would I want that? Right. Um, cause that's what it was with Gigi, you know, people would book him and say, some kid, there's always some young Turk who would say, I'm going to make my bones booking Gigi Allen. It was going to be the wildest show at Greensboro or, or, you know, or Hoboken has ever seen. And the second the show would start, they'd regret that. Mm. Um, besides that, like I said, though, Gigi, you know, he knew what he was doing. You know, he, he was very in control of his own charisma. And he was very self-aware. Um, uh, my friend Dave Insurgent, who was a singer in a very popular New York hardcore punk band called Reagan Youth. And they were um, sort of like anarchist punk rock hippies. They were very progressive. Their songs were uh, p- political um, and ultra left, and um, of course anti Reagan. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. ironically, um, despite their name. And uh, Dave uh, was also a very, very funny guy. I met him in film school. He was a nice Jewish boy from Queens. Uh, I had met his parents, who were Holocaust survivors. They were very, very sweet. I had no idea, you know, where they went wrong. You know, raising raising this this nice boy, who you know they, they bar mitzvahed with um, all the uh, alacrity and accoutrements that a uh, nice Jewish boy in Queens deserves. Um, you know, flat-chested girls and gold chains, the whole bit. Um, <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, he, he, he you know, jumped, <laughs> jumped the beam and, uh, you know, was wearing chains and dreadlocks and combat boots and Che Guevara shirts. Uh, but he was a very popular guy on the scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and he got into some uh, bad trouble. He got into some bad drugs. And, um, and, yeah, that's the horrible end of the story was his girlfriend was killed by Joel Rifkin, the serial murderer. And oh, that's. I'm sorry. You know what? I'm so, as soon as you said that, I remember. I, I realized that I, I, how badly I, I, I muddled those two stories. You yeah. know, and it was sort of a downward spiral. And that was that was the last straw for Dave. I mean, he was you know bad into the junk, and um, his girlfriend was murdered. They found her body in like eleven different places, mm-hmm. and um, after that, his, his father killed his mother in a freak accident. He just rolled the car over the driveway. She was bent down to pull some weeds out of the driveway. I mean, it's just, just, just a horrible, horrible, tragic thing. Um, and, you know, soon after that, you know, Dave swallowed a bottle of pills. That was the end of it. Um, uh-huh. And, you know, I mean, this is a guy that had a lot of life in him and was very, uh, very vivacious and very funny and very creative in many ways ahead of his time. Um, and his whole message, uh, which I love to share, it was to liberate yourself and not to be a knee-jerk uh, reactionary. Mm. And you ask about when people started throwing bottles at me, that's where it really started. We had this uh, comedy routine, and <laughs> I say comedy, um, I'm defining it pretty loosely. But basically, I'd get up on stage before the shows wearing this bright green madras jacket, and my hair slicked back. I was like the world's worst, you know, Borscht Belt comedian. It was, it was like sort of Henny Youngman as Satan. Um, we start telling these dead Jew jokes, 
and, and you know, and jokes about like nuking uh, Nicaragua, which is a real, real sore point for uh, left left wingers in the late eighties. Um, right. And people would start throwing things like crazy bottles. I got hit in the head with someone's keys. I mean, who throws their keys? Um, so and Dave loved that, and then they'd start the show, and his whole message would be like, "Hey, don't you see it's a put on?" And it would, but it would never fail. People just couldn't see past it. Liberty yeah, well, you know, once they start hearing those jokes, it, it's probably a little hard for them to uh, reconnect to. Oh, it's it's humor. <laughs> well, the whole thing was put on very very matter of factly and unironically. We had the drummer hitting rim shots, but um, um, a lot of sort of like Borscht Belt Las Vegas shtick going on. I think I would hope by now, twenty years later, an audience would be sophisticated enough to tell that they're having their chains ganked. But uh, you hit a bunch of you know, raging liberals with a show like that, and they they, they just see red. <laughs> It's like pushing a button. It's like, you know, yeah. ringing a bell. Uh, you know, I was curious about some of your other music experiences. And that uh, I think uh, you, you, with one of the bands, uh, you'll, have to, you'll have to remind me which one. You, but you, were, you went to Spain with $1,000, I think, in your pocket. And three, I think it was three years later, you came back with $1,000 in your pocket. And I'm thinking, you know, it, it, it reads like the band was fairly successful. Is it that... Um, the money just gets spent, or I mean, you never seem to have any money. I, I guess. It's, you know, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I wonder from story to story to story. Where did it go? Where does like, it go? Where does it, it all go? go? It goes on the bar. It goes to the drug dealer. It goes, you know, into restaurant bills. But it goes to rent too, and and, and gear and, and a lifestyle. Um, we never got rich playing rock and roll. But I mean, I think that I, you know, I came back with the same thousand dollars I started with. Uh, that, that's a net positive. <laughs> um, <laughs> other people might do their accounting differently, of course. Hmm. Uh-huh. Maybe that's why I'm no longer the publisher of High Times. Um, but you know, but but for three years we made money. We played gigs every week, and the rent got paid. And uh, the uh, the camel—that's uh, what you call the drug dealer in Spanish, the camel. Yeah. Uh, the camel got paid, and um, and we ate spectacularly, and we lived very very nice lifestyles, and you know, all had very nice apartments in Madrid. Um, we took planes to the Canary Islands, and we traveled all over Europe and France, and we did okay. We never rolled the van. Everybody sort of walked through that door and came out of it okay, sort of. Since, yeah. since then, uh, the singer's dead, and everybody else is married and has kids, but I managed to dodge those bullets. Oh, man. That's the one, one dead, one, the rest married, and uh, you've avoided that. Well, the, the thing is, what I found interesting was to go from reading about that, and I think you came back, and then you wound up at High Times, where... Um, despite your, you know, history of uh, the rock and roll and, and the road and the sex and the drugs, I mean, you turn out to be a pretty good publisher in the sense that you, you know, you raise circulation, you uh, raise income. And I'm thinking, how could the guy who knew to do all this go to Europe with a thousand bucks and come back three years later with still a thousand bucks, and yet, you know, still be able to pull off this miracle at high times? Well, you know, when I went to Spain, my goal wasn't to make money. Ah. My goal was to play the drums in a great rock and roll band. And, uh, and to live that lifestyle. And that's what I did. I hit that goal. And um, there was a point I realized I probably wasn't going to take it any, any further than we already had. And it was time, time to move on. Obviously, when I got to High Times and they uh, it asked me to become the publisher, my goal was what all publishers' goals are, which is to raise circulation in advertising. I wanted to put out a kick-ass magazine. I wanted to you know, restore High Times. I was a huge fan of High Times. And I grew up uh, reading High Times, and I'd been a writer for High Times, and I really admired the legacy of the magazine and many of the journalists who had been, you know, you know through the pages over the years, mm-hmm. and as a counterculture icon, and really as a big middle finger to the establishment. I thought High Times, you know, was, was the NAS. And I really, really wanted to um, raise that flag. Uh, so yeah, my, my goals in uh, selling magazines, um, you know, were. Uh, Pretty, um, I mean, there's nothing vague about it. And the idea, and you asked me, you know, how old I was before, which is yeah. funny. I think where I am is I straddle two generations, and I think this was like a real strength for me mm-hmm. in that um, I grew up with, on 60s counterculture, and of course, when I was a teenager and first getting into smoking pot and dropping acid, uh, we were listening to the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead and Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix and like that. And of course, punk rock came up right at the same time that I was getting interested in these things. So uh, it was very normal to you know, be listening to Jimi Hendrix and the Sex Pistols you know, on the same afternoon. And even moving forward through the 80s, uh, you know, while I could easily relate to what the Jefferson Airplane were doing, I also loved Public Enemy and Who's Gerdoux. 
Mm. And I think that was a real advantage of the older cats who had really had no idea what the 80s or the 90s were about. They just just weren't weren't aware. You know, they were still wearing you know you know their their freak flags to work, and and thinking you know I mean Jerry died, but no one got the memo. Right. Um, so yeah, right. well, I was successful. Um, you know, in strictly objective terms. Uh, you know, numbers went up. The dial was pointed in the right direction. But, um, but in terms of being a, a manager of a room full of hippies and stoners, I was a miserable failure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to. Uh, I want one more highlight from your uh, high times days. Is that there's a great story when you when you come to the magazine and you uh, you uh, make the commitment to go with Ozzy Osbourne on the cover. And uh, uh, there's a great story that goes with that. And and I've got. Uh, uh, the uh, song from from your CD uh, about Ozzy. I, I can't play the whole thing because we'd run out of time here. So what I want to do is have you uh, kind of introduce the song a little bit, a little background on it, and then I'm just going to play a, a, about a minute or so. Uh, and I want to warn you that I, I don't have a fader here, so it's just going to cut out and then I'll come back in. All right, I think we can handle that. Well, this is where um, my book starts. This is um, the teaser right here, and it starts at a High Times editorial meeting. Um, and let me tell you, it was like Groundhog Day over there. And it was the same meeting every day. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you, you'd never want to get into a, an argument with somebody because you'd have to have that same argument the next day. They just wouldn't remember. And it's, it starts out um, with the, uh, <laughs> the usual lack of uh, shimmer and shine that I'd get from the editorial staff over there uh, just to put out one more redundant magazine cover. Um, and just put out the same magazine over and over again. And you wonder, are the editors not remembering what we did last month, or are the readers not remembering either? <laughs> but so I'll tell you, tell you what, Bob, when we started putting out um, what I thought was a better magazine and changing the format a little bit, um, the strategy was really easy. You want to keep all the readers you have, and you want to make new ones at the same time. It's, it's yeah. not, nothing, nothing crazy. It's not curing cancer. It, it, it's, it's not that complex. So you try to stay loyal to the old guard, you know, the hippies and the counterculture people and the deadheads and, and the fish heads and the jam band cats. But you also, you know, there's a whole audience of people out there who are listening to heavy metal records or classic rock records or punk rock records or what have you. We're watching wrestling on television or getting stoned in venues other than, uh, you know, Bonnaroo. And we wanted to reach them too. And um, the people at times like to put everything into a box, you know? And it's really hard to get people to think outside their, their set ways. But, you know, you show them the numbers and say, man, it just, just isn't working anymore. People are starting to catch on. You've been doing the same thing every month for a while. And um, it's time for a change. Hmm. Kicking right. and screaming into the 21st century. All right. Give a listen to this, folks. We'll be back in about a minute or two. putting Bob Marley on the cover is going to be looking for a new job. I would get in a lot of trouble for saying things like that, but seriously, Bob fucking Marley, that's the best you've got? Clearly these guys had run out of ideas. Bob Marley had already been on the cover three times. There wasn't a whole lot left to report. After years of pumping out seedy sex books and down market filth, promoting the careers of devil-worshipping wrestlers and bourbon street strippers, I had finally scored my dream job, publisher of marijuana magazine, High Times, what my grandma used to call that dope rag. I had just finished giving one of my big speeches, and one editor whose eyes looked like hemorrhoids from years of staring down the length of a water pipe thumbed through an old issue dispassionately. Another amused himself with a chocolate chip cookie, and the others had as much interest in my pep rally as a monkey might have in a chess match. I should have brought them a bright red rubber ball to play with, or a coconut, because, man, these guys knew how to make a totally excellent bong out of a coconut. The music editor was always the last to arrive at these meetings and usually eating a pile of snacks, making a mess. Finally, crumbs all over the place, he said. I think we can get David Crosby. Are you kidding me? David fucking Crosby? And here I had my heart set on Joan Baez. Man, this was not going to be easy. 
He was the only editor in the world who thought that punk was a passing fad and that disco was cool. It was one of those rare moments of real life, deus ex machina, when Ozzy Osbourne's publicist called, just moments after the meeting broke up. The music editor fielded the call, actually put the woman on hold, and came into my office. Ozzy Osbourne wants to be in our magazine. Well, what are you waiting for? Tell them, yes! Well, I'd love to. I'd love to go on, but it's it's actually about a ten minute cut. Um, Ozzy, uh, so Ozzy, Ozzy uh, comes in for the cover shoot, and you get a great deal of publicity out of this, as I recall. Well, yeah, Ozzy came down, and uh, we were all excited. About half the staff was ex- real excited about it. The younger uh, part of the staff, because we loved Ozzy, it was like putting Elvis on the cover, right? And at the time, he wasn't really doing much of anything. This was before the TV show and before he'd really um, come back into you know, mass consciousness. He was doing Ozfest, but that was just you know to that you know very specific audience. But I also knew that is the High Times audience. Um, the older guard, of course, it's just said, "Hey, look, you know, Mike, you know, you're going to ruin the High Times because we're a hippie magazine and Ozzy is heavy metal." And um, that's sort of the way, that's sort of the, the pretzel logic I sort of dealt with every day. But Ozzy came down, and he was very professional, very nice, and complete, you know, complete drug casualty, just like you see him on the TV, sort of shuffles around, and, um, you know, not quite under his own power. And he has this, this posse of these, like, spinal tap-looking roadie dudes with him. And he comes into the studio, and we have it all, all, all set up. We've got this bright, this big uh, silver skull filled with bright green weed. And there's a, a chalice filled with weed, and there, there are like scepters and scimitars and all those gothic trappings. It was it was really beautiful, and a big throne from this sit in and you know talk to the skull filled with pot, and he just took one look. He came in. He's like, "Fuck, is that real?" Well, well, yeah, Oz, sure it is. You bet. Um, you want to try some? All those handlers weren't too happy with that. You know, the funny thing is, they were. You know, he was supposed to be in rehab, of course. And yeah. He's always supposed to be in rehab, and we were worried that he didn't, wouldn't even want to talk about drugs. And of course, once he started, he wouldn't shut the fuck up. He was telling us about the 400 quaaludes he had, you know, in his freezer because when they stopped making them, he had a panic attack. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, like screwy squirrel for the new millennium, it saved up. Anyway, um, after the shoot, uh, there was a lot of the weed went missing. You know, you weigh the pot at the beginning of the shoot. There's like a pound of reefer in this room, and and really nice reefer too. Like you know, very photogenic, <laughs> intact buds. You know, like the size of baseball bats. And all of a sudden, you know, like like a few ounces are, are gone. And there's a guy who had brought the pot for us to take pictures of. And you'd be surprised at how easy it is to find someone to loan you some pot to take pictures of if your name's going to be in High Times, because then their stock goes through the roof. Um, of course, and everybody loves smoking the centerfold weed. Uh, and all of a sudden he's like, well, dude, you owe me, you know, you owe me, uh, 1600 bucks. You owe me 2000 bucks. And I'm wondering, well, what the hell happened to my weed? Now, I don't know for sure. There was a lot of smoke in that room and there were some pretty sticky buds. And I never really pointed the finger at anybody, but I was told that it was Ozzy's roadie dudes Mm -hmm. that were stuffing their pockets on the way out. And that, you know, it was implied that he was complicit, allegedly, I should say, right. Um, you know, in this sort of like stoner larceny. And, you know, the fucked up thing, of course, is if Ozzy had asked, we would have given him whatever he wanted. He could have the whole damn skull filled with potties. Ozzy Osbourne, we love this guy. We're very appreciative that he came down, and um, he was a totally good sport about the whole shoot. Very professional, really turned it on for the cameras. But meanwhile, I owe a few thousand dollars. And, um, you know, as I said, my goal in being a publisher of a magazine is to sell magazines. Mm-hmm. So I didn't think twice about dropping a dime uh, and leaking the story to Page Six and a few other people that, hey, all this pot went missing. And, you know, I never said that Ozzy stole the pot. But, you know, you know, my magic eight ball said signs point to yes. And about a few seconds ago, Howard Stern was talking about it. And uh, since it was on Page Six, it was picked up by lots of other gossip columns. And the magazine went flying off the stands, of course. It was one of the most successful magazines in High Times history. But the beginning of a whole world of trouble with the hippies. Mm-hmm. At high times. Well, it's a, it's a great story in the book, and it, uh, I, I, I like the uh, I like the cut off the album too. <laughs> it, it, it's nice to hear it from you, you know. Um, 
Uh, one of the uh, aspects of your career that we haven't touched on, and uh, the time is kind of flying by, is your early career as a oh my god a pornographer. And I want to read I want to read this uh, very Talking short. It. <laughs> it is it's just disgusting. You should be ashamed. And I and and therefore I want to read this uh, short section uh, from your book, uh, which I'll repeat the title of now. Uh, it's I have fun everywhere I go. Uh, this is, uh, this is you getting your first job doing this, um, and it goes like this. Can you type? Uh, sure. That job interview went well. <laughs> After affirming that I was indeed a 45, minute, 45 words per minute man, I was seated in front of a battered IBM Selectric, the detritus of someone's failed business, but in those dark days before the Mac Classic, still at the apex of writing machines. Set it up, boy, girl, and then bring the camera in close. Give me like a thousand words. I wasn't really expecting to be auditioned on the spot, but I was up to the challenge. I put my paws on the keys and began banging away, determined to unleash a torrent of such unrivaled smut that I'd be hired on the spot and quickly declared the greatest eroticist since Ovid. I did as I was told. Jack and Jill were on the couch, lingering over a kiss. And then, like a hooker in heat, Jill goes for the old okie doke and they're off to the races. The IBM type ball clicked and clattered. Sparks were flying. It sounded like an elevated train tearing across the south side of Chicago. Who knew that I had it in me? She sucked. He groaned. She pulled up her skirt, her wet dum de dum his hard blah, 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 and shazam! Twenty minutes later, I pulled my sordid little vignette out of the typewriter. The roller mechanism whirred contentedly. The editor who had interviewed me so efficiently gave a good once-over. When can you start? How about those days? Do you miss that time? <laughs> uh, boy, I wish all job interviews went that well. <laughs> um, no, yeah, yeah, yes and no. I mean, it was a good place to learn how to write because we had to write a book a week. If you can imagine such a crazy thing, I mean, it was a real grindhouse, and everybody there wrote everything. And it, was, it was a great creative writing class because we'd write. Um, my first book, I think, was an S and M book. It was called Cindy's Brutal Ordeal. And it was about a heavy metal band and, and, and their groupie. And the stories always sort of went the same sort of way. At first, uh, the young girl, assuming it's a young girl, because we, um, it wasn't always just about boys and girls. Um, you see, the young woman, uh, at first, she's not really ready to give it up. And then maybe she has a little taste. And then there's a little clumsy uh, petting, perhaps. And then one day, backstage at the heavy metal concert, or out you know, behind the barn, or in, in the back of Zach's hot rod, she gives it up. And then she can't get enough. That's always the formula. And after, and after that, it's a race to the finish. Uh, yeah, I dug that job because you learned how to write. You had to sit down and write whether you were hungover or didn't feel like it, problems at home. I mean, you just had to get to the end of the pages. Yeah. And, I mean, hell, when I was in college, I got intimidated by writing like eight or ten page papers, which were all bullshit anyway. And all of a right. sudden, I was like writing like 200 pages a week. Well, standards in that industry are always interesting to me. I, <laughs> yeah, me too. Right. Right. I did. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'd done some writing for Gallery, and I did a, a story for them about where I went out and collected guys' best uh, bachelor party stories. Mm-hmm. And so I put out the word to all my buddies, and I said, "Hey, you know, I, if you got a good bachelor party story, uh, let me let me uh, let me hear it." So uh, a guy I went to college with leaves a message on my answering machine. He says, "Hey, call me up if you want to hear the story of the lactating stripper." <laughs> and I thought, "Yeah, I want to hear that story." So I call him up and I get it, and I use that as the lead in the story. And uh, I send in the story, and uh, I can't remember the guy. I want to say the guy's name was Barry something. But um, anyway, he he uh, calls me up. He says, "Listen, we really like the story. We want to use it, but uh, I need to send you a, uh, a copy of our, uh, uh, our 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 standards, our, our uh, you know what we do and what we don't do." And I was like, "You guys have standards?" Well, these might have been the old Canadian guidelines. Which I is- I don't know. Well, it turns out. They, they have, their policy was uh, they would never show motherhood in a sexual light and lactating uh, uh, go-go dancer, that, that just crossed the line for them. And I was just like, wow, okay. Yeah, well, you know, there's a there legend on somewhere. I probably still have a copy the old Canadian standard because uh, most of the men's magazines that came out of New York, uh, we all distributed in Canada as well, and they, they don't have a First Amendment. They have the Queen's Council on Censorship. Um, a lot of people don't know that, you know. I mean, there's no real free speech protection uh, up there in the, in the frozen Yukon. Um, so there were all these rules that you couldn't uh, you couldn't go over the line. It would be no problem here. It had nothing to do with any editorial standards or contemporary obscenity standards in the United States. 
or even really what control things is what a distributor was willing to handle, uh, which has changed over the years. Uh, because now everything's hardcore in the stands, and uh, back in the day there was no penetration, there was no insertion, there were no uh, erections, and it was very strict. An erection was 45 degrees from the body. Mm -hmm. uh, um, if a woman was touching herself and couldn't see her fingernail, that was penetration. But the Canadian guidelines were crazy because you couldn't show anything that um, inflicted pain, and that meant like even having like like handcuffs on your belt. They were very, very strict, and the magazines had to watch that because uh, they, they would just turn the magazines you know, down at the border and send them back. And for a magazine like Gallery, you could lose you know, a third of your sales just for like one photo. Right. You know? Um, but yeah, standards. You know what? Screw, when I started out there, I mean, it was a really great magazine. And the guys I were dealing with, um, they'd worked for Playboy, they'd worked for newspapers, and they, they wanted good stuff. They wanted it fact checked, they wanted it smart, they wanted it sharp. And a hustler, too. I worked with some very good editors who were, you know, really wanted stuff to be well written. Unlike the, the porn novels, where nobody wanted it good, they just wanted it Tuesday. I used to say, we don't mind good writing as long as it doesn't slow you down. Do you think the the adult uh, uh, the book the adult books in the magazine? I mean, is that a is that a career path for people today? Is it? It used to be, you know, you would write for those uh, publications because uh, you know they were looking for good stuff, and and you could get in there, and then you could kind of go on. And meanwhile, you get your feet wet in the business. But is that is that still a, a path for some people? Yeah, I don't think I don't think it is. Um, because the magazine, the porn magazine business, well, the whole magazine business, has been so decimated by the Internet uh, that there's not much of a market for the magazines as, as much, and certainly um, people aren't reading them for the interviews as they once did. Mm. Um, I mean, the thing is, you don't jump into Playboy. You don't just jump into Playboy writing suck and fuck stories. Maybe you can get into Penthouse Letters doing that, but I don't think, you know, it's not as easy to make the leap to Playboy or even to Penthouse, you know, regular Penthouse, where they're trying, once again, to raise, you know, the quality of the magazine. And don't forget, in the 70s, these guys hired name writers. They paid a lot of money for good investigative journalism. Playboy, very famous for its interviews and its jazz reviews and mm -hmm. really, really being a trendsetter, Playboy. Um, not, not so much the case any, anymore. Uh, I don't know that you can jump from writing smut into jumping into a mainstream magazine. Um, you know, somewhere along the line. I think the way to get into it is you've got to meet somebody at a party and convince them to let you write something for, like, the front of the book in Maxim. I think that's where everybody starts these days, right? Yeah, I, I guess so. Front of book or reviews or even a blog if it was some, you know, something more serious than uh, just Jack and Jill on mm -hmm. the couch. It's a tough <laughs> racket. Boy, back in the day, you used to be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, I need a gig. Can I write you guys some... Uh, some letters, what do you need? You need some lesbian housewife confessions, maybe something that happened on the Crosstown bus, cable repairman story, what do you guys need? And the editor would say, oh, sure, Mike. And, uh, you know, dole out $1,000 of work, which I could, you know, turn around in a couple of days. But, you know, those, those days are long gone. Yeah. I always suspected that Penthouse paid for a lot of those letters, but I was surprised at how much you said that they paid at the time. Yeah, I got, you know, and, and Hustler paid great money, too. These are very big mass market magazines, and the stuff was good, though. You know, they wouldn't take just trash. They really did want it sharp, and they wanted, um, you know, people to be able to, you know, let's say, insert themselves vertically into the pros. Mm. Dear Penthouse, I can't believe it happened to me. Exactly. That's, until that's one day. <laughs> <laughs> I was a virgin until... Um, so what what what's up next for you? The books the books just been out a short time. Uh, you did a as you said I think the uh, loudest tour, the world's uh, loudest book tour, and it continues. Yeah. Uh, that's what's happening right now. Uh, promoting uh, my book, I have fun everywhere I go. Uh, we're taking the the band out, the Edison Rocket Train and the Rocket Train Delta Science Orchestra. Uh, a couple of gigs in New York. You can check my website mikeedison.com, which leads you to my publisher's uh, page. But all the dates are there, and some MP3s and some groovy comics. Um, and yeah, we're going to be promoting this uh, book for a while and continue to have fun everywhere I go. Uh, hopefully I'll be back in the ring soon enough and scribbling some more smut and uh, <laughs> some more dope. And who knows, I'm sure there'll be more savage tales to be had. And uh, yeah, I'm having a blast. You know, uh, you know, sometimes writing is like homework, but this, this was just, dude, this was a gas. Every day I sat down to write this book was just better and better every day. I really felt good about the whole thing. That's great. Well, it is a, it's a very entertaining read. Uh, I I, uh, I really like from you know from front to back. It was just you never knew where where uh, Mike Edison's going to take you in this book, and it's all crazy and it's all 
uh, fun. And, and, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not hard to believe the, the title, you know, that you do have fun everywhere you go. Uh, I don't always get the sense that the people around you are always having a good time, but you seem to have the, <laughs> bring the right attitude uh, to everything that you did. Yeah, you know, this book is a celebration. I'm always shocked at, uh, you know, people who write these bummers about the porn industry or, or about doing drugs. Man, if you're having a miserable time doing drugs, you ought to stop. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a downside to all this. Of course there is. Not that I thought anybody would be interested in reading, you know, you know a book about a series of hangovers, but um, I was really always trying to be in the moment. I mean, I really, I really like what I do, and mm-hmm. that's what I try to like to, you know, to bring to whatever job it is, whether it's running the dope magazine or running a wrestling magazine or playing in a rock and roll band or editing the books I do now is I always figure that if you're having fun doing it, then the people who you know, pick it up or read it are going to have, you know, hopefully see that, but have as much fun as you do. Because if you're having a drag, they can tell in a heartbeat, and then you're mm-hmm. sunk. All right. Well, Mike, um, I really appreciate your time. I had a good time talking with you today. I, I suspect we could uh, – we could sit and talk for a much longer time. There's so much that we didn't get to cover, but I uh, really appreciate you joining us on Mr. Media today. That was, was my extreme pleasure. Um, I'm still having fun, and I hope everyone uh, has fun everywhere they go. All right. Well, thanks very much for calling in. Rock and roll, Bob. Thank you very much. All right. Good luck. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So you can uh, leap into the world. That, that's a pretty crazy world uh, of Mike Edison at his website, www.mikeedison.com. E-D-I-S-O-N, it's all one word, MikeEdison.com, which the FDA says is a gateway drug to harder websites. I don't know. You, you look that up. Anyway, but from MikeEdison.com, you can find your way to uh, Edison Rocket Train Music, uh, to How Punk Rock Ruined My Life, and much more weird shit that's all involved with Mike. And i got to read the uh, title of his book again, which is available on MrMedia.com or Amazon. The title is, I Have Fun Everywhere I Go. Subtitle is Savage Tales of Pot, Porn, Punk Rock, Pro Wrestling, Talking Apes. Uh, we didn't even get into that. Evil Bosses, Dirty Blues, American Heroes, and the Most Notorious Magazines in the World. All by Mike Edison. And folks, for a dozen more celebrity and media newsmaker interviews, surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com, where you can listen to my conversations with the stars, creators, and producers of Army Wives, 24, The Big Bang Theory, Pearls Before Swine, Tell Me You Love Me, The Dark Knight, and many more. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media uh, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites, whether you listen to us on Blog Talk Radio, uh, Blueberry, uh, Zencast, Odeo, or iTunes. Thanks so much for joining us today. As always, I appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Talk to you again real soon.